I am going to welcome you this evening. My name is Jenny Zorn. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the University. And I'm quite pleased to see that we have a full house that really is overflowing. Uh, I really look forward to this event tonight. Uh, uh, been following it and, and anticipating tonight to be able to uh, hear from our speaker. Uh, the university is, um, this is one of the main roles a university plays for a community, is to be able to host these sorts of events, invite our community partners in, and be able to have these sort of discussions uh, that are very important for our society and our community. And here in Bakersfield, we're quite honored to be able to have this invited guest come in tonight. And you're, you're, I think you're going to be very impressed uh, with the sorts of discussions that I hope will involve, evolve as we come through. So thank you all very much. The president is out of town and was not able to be here tonight, but she extends her uh, warm wishes to you and uh, appreciation for showing up tonight for such an important event like that. She really wishes she could be here with us. So thank you very much for coming and I'm going to turn it over to the director of the Kegley Institute. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, thank you, Professor Zorn, for your welcoming comments and for your support of this event. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and welcome, everybody, to the 14th Annual Kegley Institute of Ethics Fall Lecture featuring Father Gregory Boyle. Um, it's really wonderful to, to see all of you here tonight. And uh, before we get started, I want to say a few special thanks, uh, first of all, to our event sponsors uh, featured here. Uh, this is the Kegley family. Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Kaiser Permanente and Adventist Health Bakersfield, St. Francis Parish, the CSUB Walter W. Stern Library, and the Reach for Greatness Mentoring Program from Stay Focused Ministries. So your support is vital in helping us to provide these important and also free admission events, which I know is appreciated by everybody here and in our community. And I also wanna thank uh, Dr. Nate Olson, and John Mostowski uh, for their key roles in helping to extend the initial invitation to Father Gregory Boyle uh, and Homeboy Industries for this event. So thank you for that. And then finally, certainly last but not least, uh, I wanna thank uh, all of you for taking time out of your schedules and kind of the busy pace of life to be here tonight. Um, as director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics, it's, it's really inspiring to see so many of you here students and, and faculty and staff, community members and campus members and beyond. Indeed, this is, this is actually why we do the work that we do at the Kegley Institute. We organize and host this and many other events to bring our communities together and to engage in kinship and across a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives in conversations on important and ethically relevant topics that are relevant to our region, but also our nation and our world. So thank you for making time to participate in that conversation tonight. And I wanna note just briefly that there are a few ways, just simple ways that you can help us continue to host these events. Um, one of the ways, uh, very simple, is to follow us on social media. Follow us on Facebook, at the Kegley Institute of Ethics, and also follow us on Twitter, um, at Kegley Ethics. And the reason that's important is it helps us to spread the word about what we're doing and kind of broaden our reach to new communities, so that's always really helpful. And then also you can, if you'd like, you can make a donation to support events like these, uh, our lecture series, our workshops, our ethics panels, and many other events. Um, you can find a, a donation portal uh, at the KIE website right there, just under our donations tab. And so if you wanna contribute, that's also greatly appreciated as well. Now with that, I'm honored to introduce our speaker tonight. So Gregory Boyle is the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, which is the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. A Jesuit priest from 1986 to 1992, Boyle served as pastor of Dolores Mission Church, then the poorest Catholic parish in Los Angeles that also had the highest concentration of gang activity in the city. In 1988, Boyle and colleagues started what would eventually become Homeboy Industries which employs and trains former gang members in a range of social enterprises, 
as well as provides critical services to thousands of men and women who walk through its doors every year seeking a better life. Father Boyle is the author of the 2010 New York Times bestseller, Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion, and the 2017 Los Angeles Times bestseller, Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship. And he's also received the California Peace Prize and has been inducted into the California Hall of Fame. Please note that tonight we have a book table in the lobby uh, of the Dore here, uh, thanks to our partners, Russo's Books, uh, and we'll have copies of uh, Father Boyle's books on sale, and he'll actually also sign some copies of those books as well, as, far, as long as time allows. So Father Boyle's talk tonight is titled, Gangs and Social Enterprises, The Ethics of Kinship. Um, and before Father Boyle speaks, we actually have two uh, Homeboy Industries trainees, Oscar and Anthony, uh, who are doing great work at Homeboy Industries, going to come up and, and share some words as well um, to start us off tonight, and then uh, Father Boyle will join us after that. Um, but in the meantime, let's welcome all three of them. How are you guys doing tonight? Well, my name is uh, Anthony Mendoza, and I'm here for uh, Homeboy Industries and Father Greg. Well, I've been working at Homeboys for three years now, and uh, it changed a lot of my life. Uh, I never really had a job in my life. I've always been in prison all my life. And um, I got into a gang in um, 1999. I was 13 years old, and I've always been in and out of juvenile hall, um, always making my mom cry. And then um, I, I uh, started having kids, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just living life fast, get, uh, into the gang, getting high, um, just doing bad things. Then I noticed like a lot of my friends started doing life in jail. My friends started dying. And I kept going in and out of jail. And then, you know, just things were hard. So then I finally said, you know what? I need to get my life together. And I remember Father Greg Boyle, he, all, he would always visit me in camp and he would tell me, come see me. So um, I remembered him and when I got out this time, I said, you know what? I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna give it a try. So I gave it a try and, um, and I like it. It feels good, it feels good being on a sober mind and and knowing that I got to get up and go to work every day and I, now I could provide for my children so I mean it, it, it's it's good to feel like like I'm doing good for myself and um as for my family they look they look at me better now um, I'm doing stuff like paying bills as well and it's, it's great, it's great having a, a, a job. I call it a job. And um, yeah, so I've been working in, in Homeboys. Like I started off as a trainee. I was sweeping and then I, I ended up in the bakery and I learned how to make bread, scooping cookies, croissants. <laughs> then they moved me to the cafe then they put me at the cash register. And I was like, damn, they really put me at the cash register. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, um, I'm doing the cash register and you know, if, it's good and I, and I really liked it. I really, I really liked it because I was interacting with people and um, it's good to, you know, make, make somebody smile and and take their order and give them their change, and, and it's real good. So now they changed me to a, to a farmer's market. And um, they changed me there because my 18 months were up and, um, it, it, and uh, it was almost time for me to go because it's an 18 month program. But 
a couple staff seen that I've been working good there and I, I'm, I was there every day. I was always on time. So they decided to keep me. And I, and I, thank, every, I thank everybody there for that. And I appreciate them for keeping me. And um, now I'm uh, driving around, setting up tents and selling bread and pastries. And, it, and it's good, it's real good. But um, yeah, I just, I just wanna say, you know, it, it, anybody can change that's doing bad, you know? You just gotta put your mind to it and, and stay strong and, and uh, just keep on the right path. I just wanna say thank you to everybody. Uh, have a good night. Oh, good evening. Yeah, I wrote a um, brief, brief about myself and what Homeboys is doing for me. Um, my name is Oscar Lopez. I come from a family from, of immigrants who migrated from Mexico City to Boyle Heights in 1980. My father was a music teacher and my mother a housewife who took care of me, my older brother and sister. I was the youngest of the family. Growing up, I would watch my father beat my mother sometimes over my dad not making enough money and also being an alcoholic. One thing I do remember besides the arguments I would see at home and us not having much to wear or eat is that my parents always showed, showed us unconditional love and support growing up. Eventually my father ended up with a 15 year sentence. Um, as for myself growing up in Boyle Heights in an area w where gang activity w was at a high rate, I ended up falling into that lifestyle. I guess I just liked the, the way they dressed the respect, money, and girls they got living the, the fast life. As time went by, I found myself in juvenile hall off and on for various crimes I committed. Also led me to boot camps and placements in juvenile hall. It's where I first met Father Greg after mass handing out his contact cards. But I guess I was too stuck in the moment to realize the hurt I was causing my family and also to myself also at a young age, consuming drugs. And as, as the years went by, I decided to finally go see Father Greg and share to him about my father being in prison and me being part of a gang only up to no good. He, he told me that day, um, on, he told me that day, go home and he would give me a call. The very next day he, he called me into his office and gave me a full-time job, but still was doing bad and good at the same time. Not understanding things didn't work that way. I ended up back in prison, going from state to federal prison 10 years, after, 10, 10 years later. Here I am today, back at Homeboys working on myself so I won't fall back into what, I, what got me to lose my freedom and family. I am no longer an active gang member. I am drug free today. I hold on dear to what I have left, which is my kids, my life and freedom. I do not fight for my neighborhood no more. I fight for a better life, even though yes, st still gets hard at times. And I start to stress and feeling like falling out. I take a walk down to work, crossing the bridges that connect Boyle Heights to downtown LA. I look at the people who live in the streets with nothing to eat, some also in jail. As I pass by Boucher Street, where the Alley County Jail is at, others in hospital dying. And here I am, highly blessed to be able to, to get out, out of bed eating at least a bowl of cereal, being free on my way to work, sober and clean. I automatically change my perspective and thank God for another day and continue to push forward with the, with the help I get from Homeboy Industries. Homeboy Industries is a place that opened me with welcomed arms, helping me peel back the layers to let that light shine that's inside of me. Because for some of us who have been incarcerated, coming from broken homes or struggled from drug addiction, it, it is hard to get out of that hole of darkness that one has created from wrong choices made in the past. 
Some say time flies and it never comes back, but for me, at Homeboys, I feel I am giving back the opportunity to go back in time and do the things I once took for granted by going back to school, working on my GD, taking parenting classes, going to therapy, also having tattoo removal done, taking anger management classes as well as attending AA. I come to understand that it is a healing process that takes time, but as long as you put eff your effort into it, Homeboy Industries is there to walk you, walk with you through the steps to get, get you on the road to success where you want to be today. Today I can say my education, social skill, personal image, and even being a better father has improved thanks to this wonderful place. Homeboy is my place where I'm growing. It's been a place where I've been accepted for who I am. I have new friends there who I met all with the same goal, trying to overcome the past and fighting against life's day-to-day -day struggles, helping, helping and working hard for a, for a better, for a better life. There I found support, love, hope, compassion, and kinship, and also a second second home. So to me, Homeboy Industries is family, and family is everything. Thanks, thanks to the supporters like yourselves, Homeboy Industries keeps growing and expanding our programs to provide as much help possible, not, not just to ex-gang members, but to our whole community and people from different country states and even countries so um people from different county states and even countries so on behalf of homeboy industries i would like to thank you all for your support and talking taking your time to listen to our stories and having us here hope to hope to have you guys visit sometime soon so you see for yourself the the you see for yourselves the unconditional love and support this place has to offer thanks again and god bless you all Um, without further delay, here's Father Greg Boyle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Anthony. Um, it's good to have you on this trip. I, uh, it's good to see my comadre, Erica. Where are you? There you are, kiddo. It's been a long time. Well, the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than these two gentlemen here. And so it was, it was a privilege to drive from L.A. and to be here. And thank you, Michael, and thank all of you here for uh, hosting us and welcoming us. Um, I've learned everything of value, and homies have taught me so much over the last 30 years, and uh, I'm humbled by what they've taught me. I, there was a homie named Lewis who kind of ran the place for a while, for like 10 years, and he was uh, kind of a force of nature, and he, he also uh, liked being a speaker, so he would speak publicly, and, and uh, he was in demand. Sometimes he would get called to speak at high schools, and they'd ask for him by name. And uh, once we went out to dinner, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. <laughs> and he said, you know, you got to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, <laughs> that is some good advice there. So brace yourselves. Uh, so here's what I think brings you here tonight. At, uh, I think you're here and lining the walls because you want the world to look differently than it currently looks. You want to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. You want to join your imagination to a larger vision and a larger love. You want to Imagine a circle of compassion, and you want to imagine nobody standing outside of it. And you want to dismantle the barriers that exclude. 
What Martin Luther King said about church could well be said of your time in this packed uh, theater. It's not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go from here to imagine something different. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we inch our way out to the margins? Because the only way the margins will ever get erased is by standing at them. If you do that, look under your feet, you'll see that they're getting erased. And so that's the hope. And you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, and you stand with those whose dignity has been denied, and you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, you get this exquisite privilege to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. You get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you get to stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. No kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, no kinship, no equality. No matter how singularly focused we may well be on those worthy goals, they actually can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we belong to each other, that we are connected. And so you go from here and you stand at the margins and you brace yourselves because people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You go from here and the voices different voices get heard. So uh, for 30 years, uh, the homies have taught me everything of value about kinship and how to imagine it and how to foster and nurture it. And they've taught me everything of value. But in the last few years, they've taught me how to text, so I'm really grateful to them because <laughs> I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, <laughs> So I'm pretty good at it, you know, dexterous, LOL, and OMG, and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> I know I can't be alone in being vexed by this autocorrect thing, you know, it's, uh, you know, I had a homegirl named Bertha, kind of a tough cookie, a drug dealer, been in prison, worked at Homeboy for a time. On a Sunday, she texted me, where are you at? So I texted her back. I said, I am about to speak at a room, to a room full of monjas. And monjas in Spanish means nuns, sisters, religious women. I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas. And I pushed send. Autocorrect told her I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas. <laughs> which she thought was pretty darn interesting. <laughs> Even now, you know, when I, uh, we arrived and I was looking at my, oh my gosh, the homies, their hair is always on fire and they need money for this. It's always asking me for feria and I, you know, it's, it paid this light and this bill and, and uh, my rent is due and I just need $100. So I had a homie who just needed $100 and I didn't have $100. So I wrote him back, things are tight. I pushed send, autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> you know, uh, what about my rent? So. So there I am in a car with two older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, and, and we're driving to Palm Desert to speak at a high school, and they're going to help me like these two guys did. And so uh, we had just had our morning meeting where we all gather, hundreds of us, where we uh, you know, to have thought for the day and a prayer and announcements. And so they get in the car, Manuel's in shotgun, we're starting to drive, and Manuel gets an incoming text, and he reads it to himself, and he chuckles. And I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. 
Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds of our workers. It's a tough job. I wouldn't want it. Gang members can occasionally be attitudinal. <laughs> so I'm glad I don't have that job. So, um, and I, so I'd just seen him. You know, he just gave me a big abrazo, Snoopy did, before the um, day began. And, and I said, well, what's he saying? He goes, oh, hang on, it's dumb. Uh, let me find it. Here it is. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> you have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, I nearly drove in oncoming traffic. We laughed so damn hard. And, <laughs> and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other, because I remember. Now they shoot text messages. <laughs> and there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? You know, I was speaking at a, um, uh, somewhere in Houston, and a hardcore gang intervention worker, a really good guy, former inmate, former gang member, working in the streets of Houston. And after my talk, he came up to me, he was kind of pleading with me, and he says, how do you reach them? meaning gang members. And I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? And I think part of the thing is that you want to, uh, you begin to serve, and that's a good thing. But service is the hallway that leads to the ballroom, and the ballroom is the place of exquisite mutuality, where there is no us and them, there's just us. At Homeboy, I'm not the great healer, and those gang members over there are in need of my exquisite healing. The truth be told, we're all a cry for help. We're all in need of healing. It's one of those things that joins us together as members of the human family. You know, uh, one of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend, and he, he was absolutely the best listener I'd ever been in the presence of. If you were talking to him, Nobody else existed. He was laser beam focused. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if someone more important was on the approach. But once, quite famously, a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which is the hope that we will bridge any distance that exists. Otherwise, we stay locked in this kind of service mode, service provider, service recipient. You don't want there to be a distance even in your service because you don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. And so you don't want there to be this distance in service, service provider, service recipient. I remember years ago, there was a homie we all called Dreamer, and nobody found more job opportunities uh, at Homeboy Industries through Homeboy than this guy. I mean, I knew him as a little mocosito growing up in the housing projects, and he was, um, you know, a knucklehead and uh, got into a gang, and his older brothers were from a gang. He... Um, one of, one of the smartest homies I've ever known, though I can't recall that he ever actually went to school, but he was very smart, had a dangerous sense of humor, which I always enjoyed. And uh, he's in his 40s now, doing well, married in the construction trade, house, kids. But in his early 20s, he was kind of a yo-yo, in and out of being locked up. He'd, uh, I'd find him a hale, you know, a job in the, you know, the private sector or in one of our uh, social enterprises. And within no time at all, he'd always gravitate back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of, and then he'd wander back to me. So it was a very frustrating, repetitious pattern. So this one time, he finished a four-month stretch of probation violation at county jail, and there he was sitting in front of my desk. And, and he says what homies often say, this time it'll be different. I went, hmm, all right. So 
With him sitting there, I picked up the phone and I called a friend of mine named Gary, who uh, uh, he ran a uh, vending machine company in Alhambra. He had hired homies in the past, so I'm hoping against hope maybe he'll do it again. And sure enough, Gary says, you tell that guy he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the next day at the vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is again in front of my desk. I couldn't believe my eyeballs. I said, híjole madre santa, here we go all over again. <laughs> but this time he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out his very first paycheck. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. <laughs> I mean, my jefita, she's proud of me, and my moritos, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, who? <laughs> and he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. I said, oh, sure. <laughs> oh, that's right. That would be God. <laughs> you thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh, God's number one. <laughs> he said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had. Struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, the thing I most remember was the two of us, we just fell out of the chairs howling with laughter. And I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider, who's the service recipient. It's mutual. So Homeboy uh, Industries was born a long time ago, 1988, when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission. At the time, it was uh, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. It's still there, but it was uh, no longer the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. They tore them down and rebuilt them many years later. But at those days, it was quite densely populated. It had eight gangs, which is not typical of public housing projects to have that many gangs there. And they were all at war with each other, making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere. So if LA was or is the gang capital of the world, my parish was the gang capital of Los Angeles. LA County claims 120,000 gang members, 1,100 gangs. I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness in 1988. And I buried my 226th uh, two, three weeks ago. Not all from that community, but I know a lot of gang members. I get asked to do this. So the first thing we did was we started a school because uh, there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them. So during the day, they were wreaking havoc. You know, they were writing on the walls. They were selling drugs. They were violent. So I walked out to the projects to these junior high age gang members, and I would kind of isolate them. And I'd say, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah. I would. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them, so it, it kind of forced my hand. So uh, right across the street from the church is our elementary school, our parochial school, grades uh, K to 8, which occupied the first two floors of the building. Well, the entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived. <laughs> and so I, I gathered all the nuns. There were nine nuns from Belgium. And I sit him down in the living room, and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out? And uh, <laughs> we could turn the convent into a school for gang members. And they looked at each other, and they said, sure. And that was the entire extent of their discernment process. <laughs> and that brought gang members in large numbers to uh, the church property, uh, which created something of a disconnect, you know, people in the parish would come up to me and say, wait, wait a minute. Um, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. 
and which I thought was a good gospel challenge. <laughs> and then the homies would say, if only we had jobs. And so myself and the women in the parish, only mainly women with children lived in the projects, we marched around the factories that surrounded uh, the projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers. And that wasn't so forthcoming. So we, we started things. We started a, a, these crews, you know, maintenance crew, landscaping crew, a crew to build our child care center, a, a graffiti removal crew, all made up of rivals from the eight gangs. And then uh, in 1992, the last day of April, um, after the Rodney Kirk, uh, King verdict, every pocket of poverty in Los Angeles exploded. And so um, it, I'd never seen anything quite like it, and I lived during the Watts uh, event. And uh, every pocket of poverty except the poorest parish in the city. So the LA Times wanted to know why this was the case. So they came and asked me. I said, well, I don't know, but I think maybe, you know, people most likely to... Um, you know, create mischief might be these 60 strategically hired gang members who uh, were working side by side with their enemies. They had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gang bang the night before, and more to the point of your question, a reason not to ignite and torch their own community. So uh, this article appears the next day. Well, the following day, I'm summoned to the office of Ray Stark, who was a uh, movie producer who happened to have $500 million. And he sat me down and he said, um, how should I use my money? As they look back on it now, I can see that I woefully undershot my request, but <laughs> I was young. So I said, there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the school. It's got ovens. I don't know, we could put hairnets on rival enemy gang members. <laughs> they could maybe bake bread and we could, well, I don't know, call the place Homeboy Bakery. And that was the extent of my business plan. <laughs> and he said, sure. So we were off and running. A month later, we, we started Homeboy Tortillas, where my comadre Erica worked. And um, and so we uh, changed our name. Once we had plural, home, uh, Homeboy Industries, we changed our name to Homeboy Industries from Jobs for a Future. And uh, not everything worked. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. Uh, homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I <laughs> did. I did not see that coming. <laughs> and nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we backed our way, we evolved our way into becoming now the largest gang intervention rehab, reentry program on our planet. We never set out to do that. <laughs> and now uh, 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to reimagine their lives, just like Oscar and Anthony. And the centerpiece, of course, is the 18-month training program. And uh, folks want in on that because it's a paid gig. And um, you know, in the early days when gang members said, if only we had jobs, so we were listening to gang members. But 15 years in, once you knew gang members, you went, ah, no, it's not about jobs. It's about healing. That, that uh, educated inmate or gang member may or may not go back to prison, and an employed one may or may not but we have an absolute guarantee at Homeboy Industries. A healed gang member will not ever go back to prison, period. And so we engage in that. It's a relational wholeness, and people find relief and rescue and respite from their chronic toxic stress that they carry. And they find a sanctuary there, a safe place where they can be held, if you will, by a community of tenderness. And then they become that sanctuary, and then they go home to their kids, and they provide that sanctuary to their kids, and for the first time in their lives, a cycle is broken. Our principle is if you don't transform your pain, you're just gonna keep inflicting it, you're just gonna keep transmitting it. 
And that's why the job part wasn't working. You know, because you'd get people and then someone would throw a monkey wrench and then people would unravel. But now after 18 months, they leave us. Some leave us, some stay. And the world will throw at them what they will, but because they're resilient, they won't be toppled by whatever the world throws at them. And so we have therapy, everybody's in therapy, uh, four paid therapists, 47 volunteer therapists, including two psychiatrists. So people are trying to help them do the work to deal with trauma and unspeakable things that happened. We have free tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. And we have a designated clinic with three laser machines, uh, one paid physician assistant, Monday through Friday, nine to five, and 42 volunteer doctors. So if anyone here is starting to regret that Roadrunner tattoo you have, uh, <laughs> see me afterwards, no questions asked. You know, if you go to the margins and you're humble, you, you, you ask, what would help? If you're driven by hubris, you go to the margins, you say, here's what your problem is. And you want to stay humble, because that's the strategy that's truer. So tattoo removal was born not because I thought it was a good idea, but because a guy named Frank, two days out of Corcoran State Prison, wanders into my office. I didn't know who he was. I'd never met him. He's sitting in front of my desk and tattooed on his forehead, filling the entire space like a damn billboard, big black block letters that said, fuck the world. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> I said, well, no, Frank, you know, maybe we could put our heads together on this one, you know. <laughs> So I found a doctor at White Memorial Hospital who donated one hour a month. He had a laser machine and chipped away at Frank's forehead and just a handful of others. And before too long, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted the same treatment. So we couldn't really stay with that arrangement. Parentheses, Frank is a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood. And there is no longer a trace of the dumbest, angriest thing he had ever done in his life. Proving once and for all, as Sister Helen Prejean says, we're all a whole lot more than the worst things we've ever done. And what else do we have? Then we have all our businesses, all social enterprises, along with case management and navigators. And um, we have uh, Homeboy Bakery is thriving, Homeboy Silkscreen. Uh, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where Oscar worked for a time in our store. Um, we have the farmer's markets where Anthony works. Um, we have Homeboy Diner, the only place you can get food at City Hall in Los Angeles. We have a restaurant at Terminal 4, American Airlines Terminal. We have a thing called Homeboy Grocery where we sell chips, salsas, and guacamole in all the Ralphs uh, in Southern California. And uh, now at the stop and shops, they're in five states on the East Coast. Um, we have Homeboy Recycling, where we uh, recycle e-waste. And uh, Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. It's kind of a who's who. If you go there for breakfast or lunch, you're bound to run into some elected official or maybe a movie star. Jim Carrey has been there many times. Jane Fonda was there two weeks ago. Uh, Jack Black, Forrest Whitaker. Um, once with only uh, two hours notice, we got a call from the Secret Service and, uh, and this was when a, a Vice President Joe Biden was Vice President. And so the Vice President wanted to uh, visit the famous Homegirl Cafe. And so it was entourage, motorcade, um, selfies with Uncle Joe. And uh, I was making my annual eight-day silent retreat, so I wasn't there. I didn't know anything about it. When I got back, uh, Louis Mora was giving me a debrief. He said, while you were gone, <laughs> uh, we had a... 
MVP visit. An MVP? I don't, do you mean a VIP? Yeah, that one, VIP. <laughs> Yeah, damn, do you imagine here at Homeboy Industries, we were visited by the Vice President of the United States, Mick Romney. <laughs> and I think you can file that under all white guys look alike. <laughs> I, think, I think we added a current affairs class shortly thereafter. But most famously of all, Diane Keaton showed up for lunch. She was of Oscar-winning fame, movie star, Godfather movies, Annie Hall. And her waitress is Glinda, and Glinda's a big girl. Been there, done that, tattooed, felon, parolee, gang member. She has no idea who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glinda rattles off the three platillos she particularly likes, and and Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one. That sounds really good. And, and it's at that point, Glenda looks at her and she goes, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. You know, like maybe we've met. <laughs> and Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and then Glenda goes, no, now I know. <laughs> we were locked up together. <laughs> Yeah, that, that just took my breath away when I heard it. And I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and if you'll permit me, Jesus looks out at the gathered and he says that you may be one. It's about us. All of us are called to go from this place this evening to become enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. At Homeboy, we're kind of allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking human beings to measure up. Instead, we hold the mirror up and we tell people the truth, that they are exactly what God had in mind when God made them. And people on the margins inhabit that truth. They become that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. A great many Buddhist texts begin with these sweet words. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are which is the whole point at Homeboy, where everybody holds the mirror up and reminds each other of the truth. Oh, nobly born. But at Homeboy, we know you have to reach in and you have to dismantle messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way, that keep people from seeing their truth. For the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and scripture is shame and disgrace. There's a line in the Acts of the Apostles that's kind of interesting and odd. It says simply, and awe came upon everyone. The measure of any community, any city, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So I get invited to give talks and um, I was invited a number of years ago to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. It was one of those what they call gang in services, you know, so in a hotel ballroom from nine to five, uh, they, they, all these social workers gather to learn about different aspects of gang life and how to respond. And, and so I figured, you know, maybe I'll give the keynote, or maybe I'll speak at lunch, or maybe I'll close the day kind of thing. So I said, yeah, and I bought my ticket. Well, a week before I was to fly, I pull out the original letter, and to my horror, I discover that I am to be the only speaker all damn day from nine to five. 
And I said to myself, oh, hell no. <laughs> so I called two homies in, Andre and Jose, both trainees around their ninth month in our 18-month training program. I sat them down and I said, look, at the end of this week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers. I'd like you to tell your stories. Take your time. Because <laughs> we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I'd never heard their stories, and Jose gets up first, and he's 25 years old, and a uh, gang member been to prison, tattooed. Um, but you know, in, in that, in the different phases where they move uh, in the 18-month program, they, he landed as a very valued member of our substance abuse team, uh, a man solid in his own recovery, and now he's helping younger homies with their addiction issues and had been to prison and a gang member. But he also had a long stretch as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. So he gets up in front of 600 social workers, and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish. And then they did what you just did. You know, we got whiplash. <laughs> I guess I was nine, he continued, when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. And she walks up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door. The guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. The second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon Everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. Nobody has ever met a treatment plan worth a damn that was born of a bad diagnosis. 
So years ago, I went to give blood like I did every year. And the guy said, oh, you got to go to a doctor, which people, you love to hear that, you know. And, and so my doctor said I had mono. And in fact, I had leukemia. And I think we can all agree there's probably a difference between mono and leukemia. And <laughs> I'm doing OK now. Or as the homies still say, I hear your cancer's in intermission. <laughs> I said, yes, apparently it stepped out to the lobby to buy popcorn. <laughs> May the line be long. <laughs> but a bad, because it was a bad diagnosis, I had to be rushed into uh, chemotherapy. You know, it, bad diagnosis is never neutral. It's always puts you behind the eight ball. You have to rush. Nobody in this room or outside of it has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. I would bet my entire life that that's never happened, not once. Gangs are not the places uh, it's, a, it's about a lethal absence of hope. No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something. So you want to get the diagnosis correct. So there I was on the Dr. Phil show. I know, what was I thinking? But <laughs> so the whole hour is on Homeboy Industries, and Phil is sitting in the middle of the stage, and, and he introduces me, and my empty stool is next to him awaiting my arrival, and when I get out there, I was horrified, because on his side of the stage is a gorgeous mahogany coffin on four, a four-wheel dolly deal. On my side of the stage is a perfectly reconstructed jail cell with bed and sink and bars and toilet. I mean, they went to great expense for these two set pieces. Well, you already know where this is going. You know, the, the producers fly out uh, three young boys, really, uh, with their very distraught single mothers, uh, African-American, a Latino, and a white kid, all who are gravitating perilously close to gang involvement. And one at a time, they come out with their mom, and Phil sort of grabs them figuratively by the lapel. Don't you see where this choice is leading you? <laughs> Not a bad Phil. So, <laughs> you know, death or prison. And finally, by the third guy, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Phil, these kids don't need more data. They're not looking for more information. They know this will end in death or prison. They don't care that it will, which is the key diagnostic moment. Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery, and misery loves company. No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang, always fleeing something. There's no exceptions to that, none. And so if we knew that that was the truth, we would infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign. We would help heal the trauma. Maybe we'd deliver mental health services in a timely and culturally appropriate way. But we want to get the diagnosis right. So let me end with this story, and then I'm going to invite my camaradas to come up here. Um, it occurs sometimes to universities to force their students to read my books against their will. <laughs> and I'm not complaining. But my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, did just that to the incoming freshman class. They had to read Tattoos on the Heart. So they said, can you come up and speak? I said, sure. They said, can you bring two homies with you? And I always do if somebody's going to pay. And uh, I always pick homies, generally speaking, in the same way. I usually pick enemies, rivals who work together, just to force them to share a hotel room, just, <laughs> just to mess with them. And, and I always pick homies who've never flown before, just for the thrill <laughs> of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. It wasn't all that long ago, I had two older vatos at LAX, and one of them, dead serious, said to me, hey, gee, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's a requirement, and uh, we'll be coming home on American. Uh, 
so I picked two homies, um, Bobby, an African-American gang member who at the time worked in the bakery, and Mario, who at the time worked in our merchandise store. I've done this hunt almost a thousand times, men and women. I've never picked anybody like this guy, Mario. Absolutely to the bone, petrified of flying. I mean, it was starting to freak me out a little bit, you know. <laughs> in fact, he was hyperventilating, you know. <gasps> And we hadn't even boarded the plane yet, you know. <laughs> so we're at Burbank Airport, which is a tiny airport in big bay windows and Southwest Airlines. Big planes, but kind of a tiny place. And, and they don't have that hermetically sealed chute that you board to get on the plane. You have to walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president. <laughs> and they have steps going to the front of the plane and steps going to the back of the plane. And so Bobby's off walking somewhere in the airport and Mario's here. Our plane arrives, it's early morning, and, and uh, people are deplaning, and I said, Mario, that's, that's gonna be our plane. And, <gasps> and I go, wow, he may die before we actually <laughs> climb those stairs, you know? And so then I see our flight crew arrives, and uh, it's early morning again, and so pilots, and there are two flight attendants, females, and both of them have very large cups of Starbucks coffee, and they're schlepping up the front steps. steps and, Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? I said, well, as soon as they sober up the pilots. Uh, <laughs> there they go now. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. So I should tell you that I think in the history of Homeboy Industries, Mario is probably the most tattooed individual who's ever worked there. He's all sleeved out and neck blackened with the name of his gang, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end so that when he's lying in his coffin, there, <laughs> there will be no doubt. <laughs> and so I had never been in public with him, so I'm walking around trying to calm him down and people are like this, you know, and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. But if you were to go to Homeboy tomorrow and walk up to anybody and say, quick, who's the kindest, most gentle soul who works here? They won't say me. They'll think for half a second, they'll say Mario. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. So we get there, and this always happens, the big talks Tuesday night with a thousand people. What they don't tell you is, during the day they have 93 other talks that they neglected to tell you about. And, and so class and class and lunch and meeting and class all damn day. And so in the classes, I, I told them, look, I'm not gonna speak at any of these. I'm gonna sit in the back of the classroom. You get up and tell your stories. Well, they were quite nervous, especially Mario, but they did a good job, stories of terror and torture and violence and abuse of every imaginable kind. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. So we get to the thousand people that night and, and they get up just like Oscar and Anthony did, and they spoke first very compellingly. And then I finished my thing, and then I invited them up to stand on either side. And, and as I'm about to do in a little second, we're going to just go ahead, raise your hand, and ask a question. And a woman over here, yes, ma'am. And she goes, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out the gates for Mario. And Mario's this tall, skinny drink of water, and he, he clutches the microphone. He's just terrified. Yes. Well, you say you're a father and you have a son and a daughter. They're about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes and, and I can sense that he's starting to tremble and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell to answer. And, and when suddenly he blurts out, I, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone clutching, closed-eyed refuge, and now I know he's losing the battle with his tears. 
but he wants to get the whole sentence out. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands, and now it's her turn to cry, and she looks at Mario and she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving, you are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And 1,000 total perfect strangers stand, and they will not stop clapping And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had decided to return him to himself and let there be no doubt, but they were returned to themselves as well. Everybody inhabiting the truth of who they are. Oh, nobly born. Remember who you really are. And this talk is not the place you've come to. It's always going to be the place you go from. And you go from here to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. And pretty soon you cease to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time as you stand at those margins. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. We don't go to the margins to rescue anybody. But go figure. If we all go there, we all find rescue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I know it's counterintuitive, but you know, you, you want to have the microphone running or you come up to the microphone. It, trust me, if you, even if we had a little bit more lights in here, you go like this, raise your hand, I'll call on you, shout it out, I'll repeat it. And one of the three of us, Oscar, Anthony, or myself, will, will respond, or you can directly ask any one of us. But we'll, we'll do the old fashioned way. You go like this, I'll go like that. And we'll only go till eight. I promise you. Maybe we'll need three questions. We'll give long ass answers. (laughs) I've never seen this happen before. Anything, say anything. Yes. Hi, I'm here from, um, you know, Bakersfield. And we have problems in our east side too. I grew up in East LA also. And I know what it's like. I went to Roosevelt. I know what it's like. I know where the projects are, the connection, Pico Lisa. I grew up in South Central. I couldn't go to school in South Central. I had to go to school in East LA. We have issues here. We have a mayor. We want to know, is there a way you could reach out to us? I'm asking you from the heart. Sure, the question is about reaching out to you about your issues here. And um, so we, I should mention we have a thing called the Global Homeboy Network. Um, when we moved into our current uh, location, people wanted us to airlift Homeboy into their town, you know, so um, Wichita was the first city. And so a delegation came and said, please airlift Homeboy and start a franchise, you know. And we didn't want to become the McDonald's of gang intervention programs. So, so we said, well, come and hang out and learn whatever. And then... Um, So we started this thing called the Global Homeboy Network. So we have 146 uh, programs uh, kind of modeled on Homeboy in the United States and 16 outside the country. And so we gather every August. Have you guys ever been at 
the gathering? No. Yeah, in August, yeah. And so uh, it's two and a half days and people come from all over the world and we share best practices, but it's kind of a methodology. You know, we, Homeboy, we believe that love is the answer. Um, community is the context. But tenderness is the methodology. Otherwise, love stays in your head or your heart. Unless it becomes tender, it doesn't really connect. There's no connective tissue. So, so we all kind of are on the same page. In the early days, we had folks from Bakersfield. So, uh, so I hope we do that again. Yeah, throw something out. Way back there, yeah. Yeah. But um, ABP just started here in Bakersfield, and it's a question to yourself and the homeboys up there. What kind of things do you think you would have wanted to hear, you know, when you were in the thick of it? Like, what do you think would have gotten to you to take something like an ABP workshop? What would have helped? Message? What would have message helped when you were knuckleheads? <laughs> <laughs> what message would have helped, you know, when you were in the streets and running wild? Would anything have helped? Put the microphone to your mouth and say something. <laughs> well, um, my message would probably be like, uh, I don't know, because if I was back then, I would have probably been thinking different. My mind wasn't right. But my message would be like, you know, just, uh, just get there. Uh, find a way, get there, and uh, achieve your goal. Yeah, what would have helped you when you were 12, 15? To avoid all that. To, you know, to, what would have convinced you? Um, what would have convinced me would, would be that um, I was going to be guaranteed to lose my family. That would have been it, like, um, like how it happened. I, I lost, um, even, even like the group of friends, they're all in prison for life or um, they're dead. I don't have a... Like in my neighborhood, I don't have those friends no more. And um, at the end of the day, those friends were really my friends. And there's probably one left, but um, I come to see as I age that friend, there's no friends but your family. And I lost my family. And so if I would have known that I was guaranteed to lose my family, it's hard. I mean, I would see it, you know, from older people, um, from my homeboys, my older homeboys that, you know, they'll do life or dead and um, losing their families. But... If I would have maybe, let's say, have like a look, um, look into my future and see that I was going to lose my family the way I did, I would have just not done what I did. But, you know, part of the thing is we settle for content when we really need to offer context. We settle for information, and what we need to offer is transformation. So we always think it's about convincing people. When has that ever worked in your life anyway? You know, it just doesn't work that way. It's not about winning the argument. Step aside, let me handle this. I'm going out there, I work the streets, and I'm, I, they'll listen to me more than they'll listen to you. Bravo. Except the task is not yakking at gang members. The task is listening. The task is allowing yourself to be reached. The task is receiving people. That that's, breaks the whole thing wide open. When you can go to any city, what's the sign of unhealth? when it's specialized, rarefied, step aside, let us handle it. We got this, we're going in there. When it's over dramatic, when it's, uh, we may not come back because it's really a dangerous job out there. That's unhealth. What's healthy? All hands on deck. If you're the proud owner of a pulse, you can be impactful here. <laughs> because if it's about yakking at gang members, then you go, well, that counts me out. But if it's about listening to people, if it's about receiving people, it's allowing yourself to be reached by people, which is what transformation looks like. Who can't do that? The problem is, is gang violence is about something else. Find the something else. So in 19th century medical history, they had all these diseases, and, and they said, we're going to address these diseases head on. And they were vexing diseases. And so they addressed them as they always did. Hospitals, doctors, nurses, medicine. Nothing worked. Then way over there, somebody happened to address the water supply in the sewer system. 
And what happened to the diseases over here? They disappeared. Why? Because the diseases were about something else. We're always doing that, even in our culture right now. By God, we're going to address racism head on. Yeah, except it's about something else. We're going to address hatred because hate is stronger than love. Yeah, the hatred's about something else. I don't know how to break this to us. It's about something else. So if you think it's about convincing gang members to do good and, and avoid evil, good luck with that. But if it's about creating a context, a community, a place, a sanctuary, you can find rest here. You can take that backpack filled with chronic toxic stress. <sighs> okay. Now we can deliver uh, services. So every city that, I'm pointing at the mayor, sorry. Um, <laughs> Every city has the same menu of services as we do. But the problem is it becomes like the DMV. What do you need, anger management? Go to window 43. Yeah, what's your thing, parenting? Yeah, that's on window 89. Yeah, we deliver all those services, anger management, parenting, you name it, GED, NA, all that stuff. But the secret sauce is the community of tenderness. That's the that's where transformation happens. You know, some reporter was asking me, you know, about me transforming lives. I've never done it. I don't even know what you're talking about. I know that transformation happens there. And it's all hands on deck. Everybody engaged in this fierce tenderness, which is the highest form of spiritual maturity. Put people there. If you can infuse, if you could have infused hope to kids for whom hope was foreign when they were 12, that would have worked. If you could have helped create an environment where trauma was healed, that would have worked. If you could have said, it's okay, let's talk about it, that would have helped. But it's not about message. See what I mean? Two questions and... We're almost done, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Years ago, I taught your book in my class, The Spiritual Quest, very popular. Um, one of the students asked about the typical expectation of the Vatos. Do they have any sense that there is a life beyond? Presumably, they're Catholic in some sense because you are. Is that a meaningful expectation? Do you guys believe in heaven? Yes, I do. <laughs> does, it, does it compel you? I don't know. Does, does that, does that sort of uh, resonate to connect with you, the, the idea of a life beyond this life, más allá de esta vida? Did you ever, was that ever a factor? Well, at times, um, when I was growing up, I really didn't think about dying or living. I really didn't care, you know? But now that I'm grown and I think about it, it I do believe in heaven and I do think of the aftermath. And um, yeah, I do believe yeah. in, there is a heaven. Yeah, the same. I mean, you're, you're in the moment, you don't really think of, I mean, as you're growing up and you're young, you're seeing, I, I would see, um, when I was young, my homeboys being buried, and, and I still wanted to be part of that, so I believe that I wasn't, that, that was not in my head, like by the thought of, of, of basically dying. It's like, it, 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 I guess you, you see it as something normal. You don't want it, but it's just normal, and you still want to be part of a neighborhood. But um, now that I'm older, I also, I just, I do think about my life after death, and um, now I start to believe and think more deep into to God. But also, you know, there, there's a, in the last two weeks, I've had three homies say to me, I don't know what's gotten over me. For the very first time in my life, I'm afraid of dying. And I said, congratulations. <laughs> you know, you've arrived. Because if you think back, I don't give a shit, you know, whether I live or die. Well, that's, that's a bad uh, 
a place to be in. But that's wonderful. Oh, great. He said, you know, I never feared death before. Now I really do. Because you kind of know what you, you have stuff that you care about, which is good. And then you can move to the freedom of, you know, what the Dalai Lama says about death, change of clothing. <laughs> you want to get to that place. But before you can get to that place, you have to care whether you live or die. Yes. Yeah, it's about working with the whole community, especially employers. So we've been doing this now for 30 years. So there's a kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval, a little bit, you know, where, where people, I want to do this, you know, who would Jesus hire, if you will. And I want to do this as an employer. But I don't want to be waiting outside the gates of New Folsom and say, hey, you want a job? You know, <laughs> so you kind of go through, because the idea is that you've done 18 months at Homeboy, you've kind of come to terms, you've re-identified who you are. Uh, you know, I used to think courage meant packing a gun, now I know that it doesn't have anything to do with it. And, and so that, that's what you kind of want. And so then you've, we've created a pool of folks who, um, you know, who are open to, because they've, they'll say, hey, send me somebody like, you know, Oscar and Anthony. You know, and, and so that's great to be able to do that. So, but the thing, nothing will change until we are absolutely, utterly convinced that we belong to each other. And so that's, uh, I'll, I'll end with this story. Um, you know, uh, there are some homies where you kind of look and, and you go, I'm not sure this guy's ever going to, turn this ship around. And there was a kid named Danny who uh, was 13 and a knucklehead from his neighborhood and always packed a gun. And I never knew him anywhere place except on the streets. And he vowed to me, I will never step foot in Homeboy Industries. And so I knew him locked up at Juvenile Hall and Youth Authority. And at 18, he went to prison just for a two year stretch. And and in recovery, in gang recovery, we say it takes what it takes, that, you know, the birth of a son, the death of a friend, a long stretch in prison. For Danny, he got out of prison to discover that his mother had six months to live and she had pancreatic cancer. And a big family, but he was kind of the hospice caregiver. And I watched him, you know, he was so tender with her, all the more remarkable because this woman tortured him as a kid. And then she died, and a week later I buried her, and a week after that he walked in for the very first time to Homeboy Industries, and I, I watched him, um, you know, laughing with guys he used to shoot at, and I watched him finish up his high school diploma, and, th and then went to East LA College. So one day he came into my office, and uh, he, he begins what he has to tell me by saying, what happened to me yesterday has never happened to me in my life. And he tells me that he was sitting on the train, the gold line that goes from Chinatown stop across the street from us to the east side. And it was a packed train, he said, but he uh, had a seat. And standing in front of him, hanging onto a pole, he said, was a medio pedo guy, a guy a little bit drunk, and he was hanging onto the pole. And Danny had a sweatshirt that said, Homeboy Industries, filling his whole chest, jobs, not jails. And the medio pedo guy says, hey, you work there. And Danny doesn't think he should really engage this guy, but he just nods. Is it any good? Danny shrugs. He says, yeah, it's helped me. In fact, I don't think I'll ever go back to prison again because of this place. So Danny gets up, and he reaches into his pocket, and he has a piece of paper, and he gets a pen. And he tells me that he starts to write the address of Homeboy Industries on this little piece of paper. And as he's telling me the story, he goes, I, I couldn't believe I knew the address by heart. <laughs> so he finishes and he hands it to the guy and he says, come see us, we'll help you. And the guy studies the piece of paper and he says, thank you. 
and the train stops and the guy gets off and Danny sits down and now he gets, starts to choke up what happened to me next has never happened to me in my whole life. Everyone on the train was staring at me. Everyone on the train was nodding at me. Everyone on the train was smiling at me. And now he can barely speak. And for the first time in my life, I felt admired. And all we could do together was we wept because I'm not sure what you're supposed to do. But we don't go to the margins to make a difference because then it's about you. But we go to the margins so the folks there will make us different. Thank you. Don't take the mic. I love you.